Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our new State Archives here in Pennsylvania. I'm Andrea Lowry, the Executive Director for the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, and I'm so pleased that you all are here to celebrate this momentous occasion with us. As the state's history agency, we like to say we are in the forever business. For the Commonwealth, the State Archives serves as our collective memory. Here you will find permanently valuable collections, including documents, maps, and photographs. We hold records valuable to the state and to Pennsylvanians, everything from William Penn's charter to the first responder notes from September 11th about Flight 93. We hold documents that tell stories of Pennsylvanians and provide context for today. And in this building, we safeguard records that are used to shape our future. This building is a vital part of state government. Many of the documents held here protect the rights of Pennsylvania and its residents and have real world applications in the present. For example, when we were faced with the pandemic, the State Archives was immediately contacted by the Department of Health to comb through our holdings and provide information about how the state had managed the outbreak of the Spanish flu in 1918. They looked to those records to help develop approaches to the public health crisis we were facing in 2020. Every day, veterans reach out to us to help document their military service to allow them to receive benefits. And because Pennsylvania was a gateway for so many Americans, millions visit each year, often virtually, looking for information about their families and their personal histories. Because we need to protect these records forever, we are standing in a building designed not only for the needs of today, but for tomorrow and for future generations of Pennsylvanians. We work in an increasingly digital world, and as you all know, technology, programs, and platforms are constantly changing. This new archives is designed to process and store both physical and digital records, protecting them and ensuring that they remain permanently accessible regardless of their format. There are too many people involved in this project to thank everyone individually for this wonderful building, but I would like to call out a few. First, thank you to our state archivist, David Carmichael, who provided the leadership and vision to ensure that we were designing an archives building that will stand the test of time. I would like to thank Paul Newhouse of HGA and Daniel Vodzak of Ateta for this beautiful design. It's a building worthy of the treasures that it holds. And I would like to thank our PHMC project architect, Lou McCrory, for ensuring that PHMC's were, needs were met so elegantly. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity yet to tour this building, we invite you to see the archives following this ceremony. And of course, this project couldn't have happened without the generous support of the state legislature and the support of the governor's office. And we're thrilled to have Governor Josh Shapiro here with us to celebrate today. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our commissioners, several of whom are in attendance. I would especially like to thank our current chair, Haley Haldeman, and our previous chairs, Nancy Moses and Andy Masick. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the staff of the State Archives, who spent three years preparing the 250 million archival documents for this move, making sure that they arrived safely and housing them on the 34 miles of shelving in this building. Lastly, I would like to thank the Department of General Services for their incredible efforts throughout the design and construction process. A special thank you is due to DGS architect Ron Metzler, who worked within Commonwealth rules and outside of the box to make sure this project went ahead. And with that, I would like to introduce the Secretary of DGS, Reggie McNeil. Thank you, Andrew. Good, uh, good uh, morning. It's still morning. I don't know where yet. Am I good? Minutes. I'm Reggie McNeil. I'm the DGS Secretary. I'm excited to be here today celebrating the opening of the Commonwealth's new archives building. Um, I'd like to thank Andrea Lowry and the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission for their partnership on this project, and Governor Josh Shapiro and his office for their leadership and support. The State Archives Building is truly a transformative project, and I am extremely impressed with the work that our team at DGS has done to construct a space that supports the near and the long-term needs of our colleagues at PHMC, ensuring the preservation of the Commonwealth's history is crucial for our future. The enhancements provided by the new State Archives building in safeguarding our records are invaluable. And some of those features include this 146,000 square foot space. It, is, it nearly doubles the space um, available at the previous site. Temperature and humidity controls that protect original documents, 
computerized high-density shelving systems that allow the PHMC to store more records within a smaller building footprint. Earlier, we have walked through the building and we looked at some of the uh, systems that protect these documents, like our fire detection systems, to minimize the records damage in the un unlikely event of a fire. And additionally, the design and construction of the archives building also incorporates several sustainability measures that will promote the PHMC's preservation efforts. DGS's capital programs office spearheaded the design and construction of this new building, and I commend them for their work. Thank you to Deputy Secretary Greg Kirk for leading this industrial team in the development of this beautiful facility. And last but certainly not least, I want to highlight the participation of our small and our small diverse businesses on this project, as the Commonwealth has been working diligently to widen the gate of opportunity to state contracts for them. The total facility cost was $75 million, and more than $22 million, around 30% of that, went to the small and small diverse business community. I'd like to give a special shout out to DGS's Bureau of Diversity, Inclusion, and Small Business Opportunities for guiding the Commonwealth on inclusive procurements, and to the design and construction companies for their commitment to our small business community. Thank you to the Vieta Group, Mascaro Construction, the Fairfield Company, and J.R. Reynolds. The new State Archives building is a testament to the skill and collaboration of Commonwealth agencies, and I thank you all for joining us today in celebration of its official opening. I will now turn things over to Governor Josh Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well, good morning. This is, I'm going to get in trouble saying this, but I think this is the coolest building in state government. I have to tell you, um, it, it is truly amazing, and I loved the brief tour I had, and I'm going to be uh, sneaking over here, Andrea, to go through those old maps and some of the old pictures and spending some time learning more about the history of our great commonwealth. I, I want to begin uh, by thanking some of our elected leaders who are here with us today. First, Mayor Wanda Williams, thank you for being such an amazing host to um, such a significant portion of our state government. We appreciate your leadership here in Harrisburg. I'm proud to be your constituent. So thank you for your, your work. And Andrea made this comment before. The investment in this facility is a result of tremendous work uh, of my predecessor, Governor Tom Wolf, and I thank him very much for his strong leadership and vision along with a bipartisan group of lawmakers who came together to make sure the resources were here to build this incredible building. And so I want to thank uh, three of those leaders who are here with us today, Representative Patty Kim, Representative Dave Madsen, and Senator John DeSanto. We thank you all for being with us this, this morning. And of course, a special thanks to Secretary McNeil. He's having a big week. He put that 20-foot Christmas tree in the Capitol, which looked beautiful the other day. And now we're, we're opening up this incredible building. I'm just grateful for your leadership and those at DGS. You all do a great job, and I thank you uh, for that. I also want to recognize the folks from the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Their chair, Haley Haldeman, we appreciate uh, your leadership, your new leadership, very much, and their executive director, Andrea Lowry. Andrea gives me um, books to read about the history of Pennsylvania. I just finished my William Penn book. I'm on to the next one. Uh, and she is a great source of knowledge if you want to know what book to read, what movie to watch, or what, what part of Pennsylvania to visit to get some um, of our history. I want to say, Andrea, to you and your team, you know, your hustle made today happen, um, your vision, your determination to get this built made it happen, and we're really grateful to you. So thank you very, very much, and I couldn't be more excited to be here today to celebrate uh, this grand opening. You know, my wife, the First Lady of the Commonwealth, um, Lori, has taken a special interest in these archives. I, I think you all are wondering, why does the First Lady keep showing up here? But one of the things that we care deeply about is figuring out a way to open up more people's eyes across Pennsylvania to our rich history and to show them things that oftentimes they don't have the chance to see or really had been hidden in the archives that were not particularly accessible. 
when our family first toured the governor's residence, um, my wife and I wanted to make sure that we were honoring the rich heritage of the Commonwealth in the new home that we were privileged to temporarily live in. And so Lori and I worked with the archivist, the State Museum, to bring new artifacts and artwork to display across the residence for more and more people to have the chance to see. From watercolors depicting all 67 counties to a sculpture of a young Ben Franklin. And just this week, state archivists helped us unearth long forgotten photos of past governors celebrating the holidays at the residence. I want you to know that um, I came up with that idea about one o'clock in the morning and drove Lori nuts when I said, we've got to find these pictures and we've got to display them. I want people to see how other first families celebrated the holidays, of course, around Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa time, around the new year. And um, I said, don't worry, the folks at the State Museum, they will find this and they found it and those pictures are now on display at the governor's residence. It's a testament uh, to our history and a recognition of those who came before us. The work you do preserves these timeless treasures that tell the story of Pennsylvania. In my office at the residence, there's also a copy of the original skull map given to the Penn family by King George III, first laying out the boundaries of our great commonwealth back in 1770. Thanks to the work that's done by so many here, we've been able to bring new life to these pieces of history hidden in our archives. And this is just the beginning. I want all Pennsylvanians and Pennsylvanians for generations to come to appreciate the important work that is done here and to be able to rediscover our history and most importantly, to learn from it. Because I firmly believe that our understanding of our history is key to determining our path forward. History, of course, is the study of where we've been, but it's also a roadmap for the future, a roadmap and sometimes a cautionary tale. From the original copy of the Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery, passed in 1780 by the General Assembly, the first legislative act passed anywhere in our country to begin the process of abolishing slavery to more recent records, and Andrea was referring to some of these, like the records of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission during the Three Mile Island incident, and the minute-by-minute -minute field notes from State Police Commissioner Colonel Paul Ivanko, who was in charge of our state law enforcement response after Flight 93 crashed in Shanksville on 9-11. There's millions of artifacts that tell our collective story preserved here in these beautiful state archives. We need to preserve them, for ourselves, for our children, and for our children's children. This new building, of course, is equipped with state-of-the-art preservation tools and rooms for our most valuable records to protect them for coming generations. It was told to me on our tour that we are 50% full. That means we've got a lot more room to grow with other historical documents. They're gonna continue to tell that story for generations to come. We've got a high security vault to house our original state charter, which is just awesome to see with new protections to prevent damages against natural disasters or environmental wear and tear. I asked our archivist to pull out what he thought was one of the coolest documents down there uh, when we took a tour, and I saw our original state constitution. And I did note that Article Two established the office of the governor, so now I know <laughs> where that authority comes from. Pennsylvania history is obviously now safer here in this building. It's also more accessible than ever before to the good people of Harrisburg who live nearby and those who will travel miles and miles and miles to come visit this beautiful site. The first floor where we are here was designed as an open and inviting space where Pennsylvanians are welcome to come and learn about their story. I mean, just look at how beautiful this is with a new research library, interactive touch screens where visitors can discover new artifacts and records and really special conference rooms where we can train archivists and from all across the Commonwealth. We want to learn more about preserving our documents and our history for counties and townships and other forms of government. We're committed to reminding Pennsylvanians that these archives aren't just here to protect our Commonwealth's treasures. They're here for people to use. They're here for people to experience. And they're here for people to learn from. On top of all these efforts, we've built a new scanning lab that will help us continue the work of digitizing all of our archives. PHMC has already made significant progress, making over 22 million images of historical documents now available for all online. 
we're harnessing the latest technology to make it easier for the grad students to sift through our records during a late night research sesh. And for the purpose look, person looking to learn a little bit about their family history, and this is really cool, we have millions of birth and death and military records available to Pennsylvanians in partnership with Ancestry.com, and it is completely free for people to come and explore. We've maintained military records for Pennsylvanians who served in World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam that are only available right here due to a terrible fire at the National Archives that destroyed millions of other personnel records, but you can still find them here in Pennsylvania. These records continue to be vitally important today. In fact, the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs relies on them to ensure veterans and their families receive the benefits that they deserve, that they have earned. All across our agencies, we continue to lean on historical documents to inform the way we serve Pennsylvanians today. Let me give you another example. Andrea shared one before. Like last year, when high path avian influenza spread to Pennsylvania flocks for the first time in decades, our Department of Agriculture turned to our state archives to review Pennsylvania's past responses to animal public health crises and helped us create a successful game plan that dramatically reduced the spread of avian flu and protected farmers who were impacted and protected their flocks. We are learning from our history and we will continue to do so and do so in a state-of-the-art facility like this. Because understand, events in our history don't remain static stories that are just simply isolated in time. Instead, they serve as the foundation for progress that we use to build a better future for all here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I hope that today inspires more Pennsylvanians to do the same. Whether you're a county historian, a local archivist, or you're just interested in history, or you're walking by on the streets of Harrisburg, I want you to come here and experience this beautiful building, experience our history, and experience the greatness of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And while you're here experiencing that, you'll probably find me wandering around looking at cool old maps. <laughs> and so with that, um, it's really my honor um, to invite this group up here where I've been given the honor of um, opening up this uh, facility officially by cutting this ribbon, uh, and then we'll be happy to come back and take some questions from the media. Thank you. That's all right. I'm always in the back row. Okay. <laughs> And Joe, I'm going to invite you up here to answer the hard ones, but any members of the media who have questions? Jan, anything? What is the thing that struck you the most whenever you were going to your building? I mean, first off, just look around. I mean, it's incredible here. Uh, the, the attention to detail, um, the work that DGS did to make it feel open and accessible. Um, it shows that we can build beautiful things here in the Commonwealth and invite all in to experience it. I also thought that the technology behind the scenes that um, the, the folks here took great pains to make sure we invested in and set up in a way that um, could really help us, you know, uh, document and save our history. That attention to detail and the technology, um, I am told, is, is best in the nation. And it was really cool uh, to be able to see the, the blend of high tech and, you know, ancient or uh, historic documents is really uh, something special. And I, I encourage you, Jan, and the other members of the media to, you know, take a tour and we'll be happy to arrange that for you so you can see it with your own eyes and appreciate the beauty of this place. 
Uh, Governor, happy Hanukkah. It's the end of the year. You, you really expect me to answer a question from you in that jacket? <laughs> Seriously, man? Juan Soto, I mean, that's, I gotta brag. Oh, no. So, uh, we're getting close to the end of the year, so I have some end of the year question, or I'll throw at least one to you. Sure. Uh, so look, this session has been unproductive by measure of total laws passed. We're at about 32 as of this week. Maybe it's got a higher, that this is maybe a week old, but Tom Wolf had signed about 70 laws at this point in his time as governor. Uh, what does the governor's, what role does the governor's office play in this and how do you think you can have a more productive 2024? Well, somewhere in the archives here, there's probably a curriculum <laughs> that talks about how a bill becomes a law. And you may remember this from elementary school it has to pass in the House, it has to pass in the Senate in identical forms, and then it comes to the governor for his signature. Um, the fact that uh, the number of bills that have reached my desk may be slightly less than Governor Wolf's is a reflection of the fact that we have a divided government. I'm the only governor in the nation uh, with a divided legislature, one chamber led by Republicans, one chamber led by Democrats. And I've been saying uh, the whole year that those chambers and those leaders of both parties need to learn how to work effectively together. I've seen some real positive uh, steps that they've taken. And together we were able to pass a common sense bipartisan budget that invested more in public education than ever before, brought about universal free breakfast for 1.7 million school children, delivered the largest targeted tax cut for our seniors in nearly two decades, those are just a few examples of the things that required bipartisan action. We hired 400 new, in the process of hiring 400 new state troopers and investing millions more in economic development that's creating jobs. All of those things happen because of that bipartisan work. We've gotten a lot done together. But it is also true that those leaders need to figure out ways to continue to work effectively together. They have a chance over these next few days when they return to Harrisburg, which I gather will be their final days in Harrisburg this year, to build on the work we've done. But just to be clear, they've left a lot of work for themselves for the last minute here. And they have to step up and get more bills to my desk and make sure that the, the, the productivity that the people of Pennsylvania deserve uh, is coming from these lawmakers. For my part, I'm gonna to continue to engage with Republicans and Democrats alike to help move things forward. But again, go to the archives, go back to your memory of elementary school. The way a bill becomes a law is it's gotta pass in the House and Senate and make its way to the governor's desk. And to be fair, there are some bills that have passed in one chamber and not the other. And so they've gotta figure out how to rectify those differences. The House, under Representative Kim's leadership, passed a minimum wage increase to $15 an hour, yet the Senate hasn't taken it up. The Senate has passed an important education reform component, giving scholarships to poor children in struggling school districts, pardon me. The House hasn't taken that up. Those are just two examples of bills that have passed in one chamber and not the other, and we've gotta make sure that they work through those issues to consider those bills and get them to my desk as quickly as possible. One of the complaints we're hearing is you, know, you are encouraging the legislative chambers to begin to work together more. But they said it does require some involvement from the governor's office, and they feel like you kind of like let them kind of go off on their own, and they're not hearing any direction. So what do you think? Well, first off, they're hearing a lot of direction from me, but I don't run the legislature, right? I mean, we're, we are separate branches of this government. They have a responsibility to govern. Um, and if they can't figure that out, just pointing fingers at me, it may make it a little bit easier for them temporarily, but it doesn't serve the interests of the good people of Pennsylvania. Our legislature has to figure out how to show up to work, and then they gotta figure out how to work together. Uh, and next week they have another test of that in the final days of this session. Yes. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. For the people there, some of them make that long drive, some of them don't. How does this new building show them this is a wise investment of tax money if they never even come here? Sure. I'm going to answer that. I'm going to invite Andrea up to share a few words as well. In the process of digitizing, what do we say, about 22 million uh, documents, they're now available online for people to be able to see. They're available online for researchers to be able to use. There are so many more tools that allow people to experience this awesomeness 
from home or from their classroom or from their college or wherever they are. And so by making it more accessible, it's not just more accessible to people who walk through the front door here, it's more accessible for people who are experiencing this online. Anything you want to add to that? Thanks for that question, and I would echo what the governor said. Um, we do see several thousand people a year typically at the State Archives, but we actually serve four to six million visitors online every year. So the vast majority of the Pennsylvanians who interact with us do so virtually. Um, there are several rooms upstairs that are dedicated completely to continuing that process of digitizing records. That's an ever-growing number that changes regularly. Um, and so we, we obviously make records accessible in that, in that way. We also provide training to local governments, much of it virtually, um, helping them with disaster planning, with uh, uh, records maintenance, retention schedules, and the archive staff does that, as I said, virtually, and, and this building serves that as well. Thank you. Anything else? Hey. Governor, I know um, you've spoken a little bit about this already, but Penn's president has been facing a lot of blowback from comments she made. Um, donors are speaking out now at this point. I know you said you think action might need to be taken, but do you think she needs to be removed, or do you think that it's time to for her? I've been very clear and consistent in my comments, and I'll restate them here. Uh, I thought the President's uh, sworn testimony in front of Congress a few days ago was unacceptable, and I thought it was shameful. Uh, leaders have a responsibility to speak and act with moral clarity. And President McGill, and for that matter, the other university presidents, failed that test. I think the board at Penn needs to now make a determination as to whether or not the views that she stated under oath reflect the views and values of the board at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Pennsylvania as an institution. Uh, I've made it clear to them that they need to act and they need to act swiftly. Uh, the board had a brief meeting yesterday. I understand they'll be meeting again uh, later this weekend uh, and, and presumably into next week. And they have to make that determination. Okay. okay. Who's your favorite governor? Historically. You can't say yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm, I've been spending a lot of time reading about Penn. Now, while Penn wasn't a governor, um, he, he was the head of the council and obviously the founder of our great commonwealth. And I've been speaking about Penn a lot more, particularly in the last few days. Uh, a man who came here with the hope of building a place that was tolerant, that welcomed people of all faiths, people of all different walks of life, uh, a place that would be inclusive at a time where inclusivity was not the order of the day. I try to live up to that every day as governor and recognize that I've been passed a baton that started with him and do everything I can to make sure here in Pennsylvania we build an inclusive place that no matter what you look like or where you come from, who you love, who you pray to, that you feel like you belong here in Pennsylvania. And so it is important to me to, to work to perfect the vision that he had. When I think about more modern day governors, um, I think a lot about Tom Ridge, a man who understood the importance, uh, as I think I do, of trying to bring people together to get things done. He governed in a really different time. It wasn't as polarized as today, but uh, he was very good at bringing people together. He was also someone who I thought had a vision and. He was also a, a great patriot, a great American, and someone who served our country incredibly honorably. While he's had some health struggles of late, uh, I try and you know, keep in touch with him as much as I can and listen to him and listen to his advice um, and figure out ways to bring the kind of civility he brought to state government into the work that, uh, that we do every day. Um, now that I've named two, now Penn wasn't a governor, I've named one governor, you know, I'm sure the other 47 or 46 uh, might have a problem with that. But one of the things that I enjoy most about reading about the former governors is to learn something that is not kind of widely known in, in our history. As an example, um, Governor Schaap 
my namesake in a strange way, not related. Um, his name was Shapiro, but he changed it to Schaap. Um, governor Schaap was the first governor to meet with the LGBTQ community and recognize them as a community and actually helped usher in a new era of um, respect for LGBTQ Pennsylvanians. And I think in many ways uh, served as the beginning of the model for the Fairness Act, the legislation that Representative Madsen, Representative Kim passed in the House, hopefully Senator DeSanto and his colleagues will take up soon, as an example of how we can expand protections for LGBTQ plus Pennsylvanians. That began with a meeting that happened in the governor's office with Governor Schaap um, as the first governor to do that. Lori and I are trying to find out, figure out ways to tell the stories of those things that are not really known about governors that have led to an expansion of freedom and opportunity in Pennsylvania and stories that um, I want more Pennsylvanians to know about. And so I think a lot about those governors who you know, oftentimes don't get the credit they deserve for things they did because it kind of went under the radar. So I know you asked me for one governor and I've, I've mentioned three, but I think about this stuff a lot. I'm always trying to get smarter on it and that's why I ask Andrea what to read and um, she does a real good job of, of helping, helping me learn. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.